morning. It's a privilege. To, <coughs> it's always a privilege to share God's word with God's people. <coughs> um, I've preached a few different places, and it's always nice to have a pulpit that hides the shaking knees. But <coughs> we come in God's strength. This morning, we're going to think about three questions as you look at the crowds. Three questions as you look at the crowds. <coughs> as we look around, we see different objects. <coughs> but as we look at the different objects, we can all see different things. <coughs> Sometimes it's on purpose. We know some of these ambiguous pictures that you look at it and you see an old lady or you see a young lady or you see this or that. And the psychologist says it tells us something. <coughs> They're designed to make us see one thing or another. But a lot of other things that every day that we, we look and we see different things. <coughs> We're watching a, a game of soccer and uh, your son might be amazing, being amazed at the skill of the player as he calls, curves that ball around the, 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 the wall into the net. <coughs> But his sister might just be thinking, he's pretty good looking. might be with the wedding planner and planning the wedding that's coming up and the mother sees, she sees dresses she sees flowers the father sees the bulls we can be clearing out the house and we find an old chair an old table one person will think that's a lot of junk we'll put it in the skip and another can see the potential behind it if we keep it and restore it the beauty behind it. <coughs> In our family, when we look at a, we have a maths equation, Naomi, who a lot of you know, she sees fractions, she sees denominators and numerators, she sees a thing of beauty. But my son Ben, when he sees a, an equation, he sees chaos and disorder. <coughs> What do you see as you look at the crowds? Our first question, what do you see when you look at the crowds? Let's look at Mark chapter 6. We turn there together, Mark chapter 6. <coughs> We're going to start reading from verse 30. But before we start reading there, just notice we look back at verse 7. And we see there that Jesus called his disciples and he began to send them out, <coughs> told them what to do. Down to verse 12, they went and proclaimed that people should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many who were sick and healed. <coughs> the disciples had gone out on their mission trip. And then we come to verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a de desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it, when it grew late, late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is late. Send them away to go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for, for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? <coughs> go and see. And when they'd found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. The, so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. 
and they, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. <coughs> so we've noticed the setting of this passage. Jesus had chosen his disciples, he taught them, and now he'd sent them out on a mission trip. And they'd been out two by two, and they'd been ministering. <coughs> and as we read the other Gospels, we see that they'd been busy, they'd been successful, God, they'd been blessed. But now they, they'd come back to Jesus, and they were tired. They needed a rest. And Jesus says to them, come away, let's, let's go on a rest. Let's go find somewhere quiet where we can get away. Because there's so much coming and going. They had, no they, they had no time to themselves. They didn't even have time to eat. But where were they going to go? The crowd was there with them all the time. Um, and so they looked around and there was a boat. <laughs> and so they got on the boat to cross the lake. I can imagine that the disciples relaxing. Sure, it's been a hard time. I'm looking forward to this rest that we're having. But they got to the other side and they hadn't got away from the crowds. When he went to the other side, he saw a great crowd. The crowd found out where Jesus was going and they'd followed him around. The message went out, Jesus is here. And he was met by a large group of people. What did the disciples see? They saw a crowd of people who were disturbing their rest. They saw a large crowd of people that were gonna need looking after, that were gonna need feeding. As the day went on, the disciples said to Jesus, send them away, let them find food for themselves. It's time for us to have a rest, let them go. The disciples saw a crowd who were a bit of a nuisance, who had spoiled their getaway, who would need feeding. <clears throat> but what did Jesus see? What did Jesus see when he looked at the same thing? He saw a crowd of people <clears throat> that were like a sheep without a shepherd. What does that mean? I don't know how many of you know sheep or have kept sheep. But sheep are pretty useless animals. They're good for eating, they're good for wool, but they're not good for much else. <coughs> they get lost. They don't know the way home. They don't know how to look after themselves. They don't know where to get their food. They can't defend themselves. You know, and sometimes sheep lie down, their feet get up in the air, and they can't get up by themselves anymore. They have to be helped. Otherwise they die. A sheep without a shepherd means there's no one to lead. There's no one to guide. There's no one to feed. There's no one to defend. There's no one to keep alive. Sheep without a shepherd are lost. They are leaderless. They are hungry. And they're at great risk of death. Jesus saw the crowds. <coughs> and saw people lost, people in great need, people at risk of death. What do you see when you see the crowds? When you see the people round about you going about their business? As we go out to the shops and the parks, what do you see when you see the people? We look, some, we look at some and sometimes we see their situation in life, where they are. Oh, they've got a good job. They haven't done so well for themselves. I've made the most of, what, of, my, of life, they haven't. We look at some and we see their possessions. I wish I was like them. I wish I had what they had. We look at some and see their abilities. I wish I was good at football or rugby, like they are. I, w I wish I was good at schoolwork like they are, so I wouldn't have to work so hard. I wish I could preach better. I wish I had what they have, a nice car, a nice house, a nice bank account. 
we look at them and we wish we had the same. We might look and we might not see them at all. There are hundreds and thousands of people around us. Do we even notice them? Do we even see them? Do we think about them? So often, we miss them altogether. For us, they don't exist. For us, they have no concern. <clears throat> How often do we see them spiritually? As sinful people, needy people, lost people, <clears throat> people without hope, people who are dying. <coughs> Jesus and the disciples came to the far side of the lake and there was a crowd of people. The disciples saw a crowd who crept them from their rest. They saw hungry people who needed fe feeding. They saw people who were a nuisance. Jesus saw people who were lost and in need, like sheep without a shepherd. How do you see the people round about you? Second question, what do you feel about the people in the crowd, the people round about us? How you feel depends a lot about, on, on what you see. The disciples saw a crowd disturbing their peace, disturbing their getaway. <coughs> they, they, they saw people who were a bit of a nuisance, and so they felt put out. They told Jesus to send them away to find food. The disciples felt helpless. What can we do? How can we find, how can we help feed these people? It's too much for us. Or we, can do, we can't do anything. Let's just send them away. The disciples felt indifferent, a bit annoyed, helpless when they saw the crowd. But what did Jesus feel? Jesus had compassion. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What does it mean to have compassion? <clears throat> it means to care. It means to be concerned. But it means a lot more than just caring. I looked up in one of the dictionaries and the definition there was a feeling of pity for the suffering or misfortune of another. But it's more than just caring, more than just a feeling of pity, more than just feeling sorry for them. The authorised version says that Jesus was moved with compassion. He cared so much that he felt it inside him. But the word means much more than that. In some places in the Bible, we read of, well, in the old translations, of bowels of mercy. And that's the same word that's used here. <coughs> the Greek word means a viscera, your innards, your guts. And so, what did Jesus feel? It means that he had a caring feeling that he felt in the pit of his stomach. We could say <coughs> it was gut-wrenching. He saw something that was extremely shocking and upsetting, and he felt it in the pit of his stomach. Jesus saw the crowd and was moved with compassion. He had a gut-wrenching feeling for their great need. He felt it in the very core of his being. And what do you feel about? What do you feel when you see the crowds? What do you feel? Again, what you or I feel depend on what we see. If we see their position in life, we might feel proud. We might feel pride that we've done better than they have. We've done better than them. We might feel inferior if someone has done much better than us or has much more than us or if they're in a position of power. We might feel jealous if they have things that, that we aspire to or things that we want. 
We might be jealous of their job, their house, their car. We might feel hatred or dislike if we think they don't deserve the things or the position that they have. And if we don't see them at all, if we don't notice them, then we feel nothing, nothing at all. The disciples felt indifferent, they felt helpless, they felt bothered, they wanted to send the people away. Jesus saw them, Jesus cared. He didn't just care, but he was moved with compassion. He felt their condition in his innermost being. Question three, what do you do about the people in the crowd? What do you do about the people in the crowd? Having seen, having felt, what do you do? What did the disciples do? The disciples did nothing. They wanted to send them away. They told Jesus, that's all we can do, send them away. They felt helpless. There are too many. We can't do anything about it. But Jesus had compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. And Jesus acted. Jesus' compassion results in action. He did something. He ignored the fact that he was tired. He, not, he ignored the fact that they hadn't been able to eat. He ignored the fact that they had come away for a rest and this was his holiday. And he did something. First of all, he taught them. We told he taught them many things. And not only was it many things, but it went on at great length until late in the day. He taught them because he cared. Until the disciples began to think, what are we going to do? It's getting late. But he did, Jesus didn't just care about their spiritual knowledge and teaching them. He cared about their physical need as well. They were hungry. They were far from home. They too were in a desolate place. He cared about their physical state. And what did he do? He fed them. And we know this story of the miracle very well. Jesus feeding the 5,000. <coughs> John's Gospel tells us that the next day, Jesus continued to teach. And as he taught the next day, he came to the most important lesson, the Gospel. Read about this in John 6, verse 35, and the following verses. Jesus told them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Jesus told them not just how not to be hungry and thirsty, but he told them how to have eternal life. He shared the gospel with them. Jesus saw the crowd as lost sheep. He had compassion on them. And he put his heart and he put his soul into their care, teaching, feeding, sharing the gospel. There are other occasions in the gospels where we read about Jesus being moved by compassion. And in all those cases, Jesus also did something. When we read of Jesus being compassionate, we read of Jesus doing something. In Mark 1, Verse 40, we read there about a leper. A leper came, beg <coughs> came begging to Jesus to be made clean. We know in those days, lepers were outcasts. People didn't want anything to do with them. People shunned them. <coughs> but Jesus had compassion and healed him and made him clean. In Matthew 20 and verse 34, we read about two blind men who were sitting by the, road, by the roadside as Jesus came past. And in those days, blind people were often beggars. No one cared about them. They couldn't work. They got what they could from begging. And as Jesus came past, these men called out, have mercy on us, Jesus, son of David. 
And Jesus had compassion. And he opened their blind eyes. In Luke 7, we hear about the widow of Nain. Her only son had, had died. And, and he was being buried. The funeral service was going past. And as Jesus came past, he was moved by compassion. He comforted the woman. And he raised her son from the dead. And John tells us another time when Jesus was deeply moved. His friend Lazarus had died. His friend Lazarus was dead three days and he'd been buried. And Jesus went to the tomb and he wept. John 11.38 tells us that Jesus was deeply moved. And so he acted and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus sees what is happening in the world. Jesus saw what was happening to people in his day. He was moved by compassion. And he did something. He acted. He taught. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. <coughs> he made clean the leper. He opened the eyes of the blind. He comforted the bereaved. And he raised the dead to life. As we think of being raised to life, of the resurrection, we think of another example of God's compassion. Every, sun, every, every, every month, first Sunday of the month, we come to the communion service. And what are we remembering then? God sees. God sees the needs of mankind. He sees the needs, but he sees especially our greatest need. Sin has separated man from God. Sin have, have, has made us guilty in front of a holy God. Sin condemns us. Sin has broken the relationship that we had, have, have with us, had with God. And that leaves people in a very bad position. Sinners before a just God deserving punishment, deserving, de deserving death. But God saw the problem. What did God feel? When he saw lost people, he felt compassion and he felt love. God loves. And God acted. <clears throat> Romans 5 tells us, while we were still, st while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4 tells us a similar thing. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sin. There was a problem. We were in trouble. God saw and God acted. But that passage in 1 John 4 goes on. There are consequences. There are logical conclusions. Beloved, if God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. If God so loved us, so, so we ought also to love. What God has done for us, what Jesus did for us, should make us different. It should change the way that we think. It should change the way that we see things. It should change the way that we feel about things. It should, cha <coughs> it should change the things that we do. If we are Christians, we should be Christ-like. So what do you see when you look at the world? What do you see in the crowds of people round about you? Do you see the things of the world, the attractions, things to distract us? Or do you see the spiritual things? Do you see the state of the world? Do you see the people in it? Do you see them as lost sheep without a shepherd? What do you feel 
when you look at the people round about you? Do you have worldly feelings, jealousy, pride, anger? Do you feel anything? Or do you have compassion? Are you moved with compassion? Do you feel their situation in the pit of your stomach? And what do you do? Do you live your life like everyone else? As we go about our daily lives, do we look any different to those around about us? Are we take, taken up with everyday problems, striving with everyday things? We live in a busy world. We've got success. We, got, we need to get on with our jobs. We've got things to pay for. We need to be happy. Or do you love like God loves and act out of a heart of love and compassion? Do you feed the hungry? <clears throat> do you comfort the bereaved? Do you teach the lost? Do you open blind eyes and help bring new life as you share the gospel? J.C. Ryle, one of the theologians in England in the end of the 19th century, 19th century, said, if you love Christ, never be ashamed to let others see it and know it. Speak for him, witness for him, live for him. Jesus saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion. He felt it deeply in his soul because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost and they're dying. And so he acted. He offered them life. He offered them the gospel. Every month, beginning of the month, we're reminded of that. The communion service reminds us, as, as we need reminding, God saw us in our need. He was moved by love and compassion. And so he acted. He sent his son to die for us. But as we sit here this morning, are you a Christian? Do you know God's love? If you're not a Christian, we've been reminded today about God's love, God's care, God's compassion. He knows you. He knows your situation. And he has died for you. Are you going to take up that offer for forgiveness of your sins? To mend the relationship with him and have eternal life? If you're a Christian here this morning, open your eyes. Look. See as Jesus saw Feel as Jesus felt and act as Jesus acted. Live your life to show the good news. Those who are lost, who are like lost sheep without a shepherd. If God so loved us, we ought also to love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves, who cares, who has compassion. We thank you that you are a God who knows us and our situation. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, that because you loved us, you came and you died for us. And you've given us new life. You saved us from death, from eternal, from eternal hell. And Lord, we... Just pray, Lord, that we will appreciate that. Lord, as your people, help us to see as you see, to feel as you feel, and to act. Father, give us a burden for the lost, I pray. For your name's sake. Amen. Thank you so much, Kevin, for reminding us of...